So just to get started, um, here's a list of some of the subjects I'm going to cover today. It's a long list, but I'm going to give a brief overview of some of these topics. And I hope to, um, after this lecture, I'm going to send out a survey and just gather information and see what other subjects um, folks would be interested in learning more about. And we could, if there's an interest, we would be happy to have um, a series of lectures on the history of Stevens. We want to keep up the momentum with the 150th that we're celebrating in 2020. And so we would be happy to schedule more virtual lectures based on the interest. And just um, a few notes of um, before we get going, I have two co hosts, uh, my colleague Ted Hotelling, he's a digital archivist, um, and also Michelle Nunes in development. They will be manning um, the waiting room as participants enter the lecture. And if you could please um, save your questions for the end. Um, I'll probably talk for about 40 or 45 minutes. And so there should be plenty of time for questions towards the end and we'll use the chat box for those questions. So just a little bit about archives and special collections, because um, I don't know if everyone knows what an archivist is. Um, our department is responsible for actively collecting, preserving, and making available primary source materials. Um, we have um, two sections in the archives and special collections. We have the university archives, which documents the history of the university. And that includes faculty papers, alumni collections, ephemera, university publications. And we also have oral histories with a project that we've been working on called the Voices of Castle Point. And special collections um, consist of manuscripts, rare books, historic artifacts, and paintings. Um, that would include the Stevens family collection, um, which we have a lot of furniture pieces and paintings in that collection as well. So you can't talk about Stevens unless you first talk about the Stevens family. Um, since we're not doing a deep dive into the Stevens family history, I'll give a brief overview and we're going to go as far back as Colonel John Stevens. So who's the Stevens family? Um, the Stevens family of Hoboken is what, one of the greatest engineering and inventor families of America. Colonel John was a colonel, um, a captain during the Revolutionary War, and he was also New Jersey state treasurer during that time. Um, he was known as the treasure on horseback because while he was in the battlefield, he had a treasure chest, um, which had the money of New Jersey in it on the back of his horse. And um, so that's where he got that name from. We actually have that treasure chest in um, the Samuel C. Williams Library in the Mary Stevens room. Um, after the war ended in 1784, um, Colonel John had been living in lower Manhattan and he actually had been eyeing this area, um, which is now known as Hoboken, for quite some time. And the gentleman that lived in this area before um, during the war was William Byard, and he was actually a Tory. So after the war, he had to flee the country and he fled to Canada. And this land um, was put on auction by the United States government. And Colonel John purchased this land for $90,000 in 1784. So that was Hoboken, and that's also, um, also parts of Weehawken were included in that purchase as well roughly 564 acres of land. Um, Colonel John advocated for the establishment of the United States Patent Office, and he was one of the first people to um, submit a, a patent. Um, also, just, you know, Colonel John, he, um, he really spent his career working towards improving transportation in America, um, and that really was his life mission. Um, and he was very innovative. In 1805, he actually um, proposed an underground tunnel, tunnel under the Hudson River um, that would be used for um, travel purposes. It's basically what the Holland Tunnel and Lincoln Tunnel are now, but in 1805. 
So here's just another list of some of um, the accomplishments of the Stevens family. Um, Colonel John was an early advocate of the railroad system. Um, before anyone else, he, he wrote a pamphlet um, describing the benefits of the railroad system in 1812. He was the very first to um, obtain a railroad charter in 1815. And in 1825, he successfully tested the first steam locomotive in America right here in Hoboken. Um, and we have the replica of that 1825 locomotive, which was recreated in 1925 for the anniversary um, and given to Stevens, actually. It's now back in the library, that, that replica. Um, it's back in the Samuel C. Williams Library now. He also um, was very successful with um, steamboat, steamboat navigation. He was the first to um, successfully navigate um, the first twin screw propelled steamboat called the Little Juliana in 1804. And the Stephen family established the first railroad company in um, the New Jersey area, the Camden and Amboy Railroad Company in 1830. So Colonel John was married to Rachel Cox Stevens. Um, they had 13 children and of those 13 children, 11 survived. Edwin A. Stevens was the youngest son of John and Rachel. He was really kind of the more business um, minded son of the family. Um, he also patented some, um, he also had a great scientific mind as well. He patented the Stevens plow in a fireproof room on a ship. Um, so he did have the technological know-how. Um, when he passed away in 1868, he left a bequest in his will to establish an institute, institution of learning. Um, and in that will, um, a one, a 150, Thousand was left to um, erect a building, which would become the Edwin A. Stevens building, and then a $500,000 endowment. Um, just taking a look at the building for a second, um, you'll see that um, the spire is not there. That it, it, so it looks very different than what the Edwin A. Stevens building looks like today if you're on campus. Um, this, um, the original design by Richard Upjohn, who was the architect, and Richard Upjohn is most um, well known for designing Trinity Church in Lower Manhattan. Um, Upjohn actually um, included this spire in his original design, but um, they decided against it when it was built. And so the spire was actually placed on the Edwin A. Stevens building in 1995 in honor of the 125th anniversary of Stevens. Um, and the a building was actually not dedicated to Edwin A. Stevens until, I actually have the wrong date in there, it was 1987. So they um, didn't officially dedicate it with that name until a little bit later. And usually if um, I've, I've done historic walking tours for Alumni Weekend um, and other events and, um, you know, I know that you, you just know that it was just called the administration building, the A building for a very long time. So when Edwin passed away um, in 1868, uh, his wife, Martha Bayard Stevens, was left in charge with his estate. And she was really the one that brought his um, dream of an institution of higher learning to fruition. So she, um, her and her brother Samuel Bayard Dodd were the first board of trustees members. And they uh, were able to achieve the act of incorporation um, in February 15th, 1870, which we know as our Founders Day, our official Founders Day. Uh, Martha was a, an amazing woman. Um, when she became a widow, she was 37 years old. She had seven children. Um, she did so much more than just help establish Stevens. Um, she also established uh, a young training, a young woman training institute called the Martha Institute, where um, women were trained in the domestic arts and also um, financial literacy. She also established the Hoboken Industrial School, and that trained young men in industrial trades like carpentry and metalwork. 
Um, additionally, she founded the St. Martha's Ward for Orphans at the St. Mary's Hospital. Um, in addition to that, she um, helped establish the Willow Terrace Houses in Hoboken for workers, um, the Holy Innocence Church, and also she um, provided the funds to construct the Hoboken Public Library. Um, Martha was known, well known around town. Um, she never really, um, she's very simple in the sense of that she did not seem like she came from um, wealth and status. Um, when she would walk around town in Hoboken, she would often get um, asked if she was looking for a furnished room to rent because they weren't aware of um, her wealth and status. Um, she was beloved by Hoboken community when she passed away in 1899 over 5,000 people came to her funeral procession. So Martha and Sam, Samuel Bayer Dodd, her brother, were tasked at the very at a, um, huge task of selecting the first president of Stevens. And they found Dr. Henry Morton. Um, Henry Morton um, had already made a name for himself um, by delivering um, these exciting lectures on light chemical effects and acoustical phenomena. And um, he was really well known for making complex scientific subjects relatable to the general public. Um, so he was selected as the first president of Stevens. He had a background in chemistry and physics. Um, and he came on board right at 1870 and worked with them to set up a curriculum and construct the first building. So he worked um, closely with Samuel Bayard Dodd to develop um, curriculum on mechanical engineering, which really hadn't been done before. Uh, he also became really good friends with Andrew Carnegie, an early board of trustee member, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a few minutes, actually. So Dr. Morton is a real renaissance man. Um, my colleagues at the library always kind of make fun of me because I call him my archives crush. He um, was the definition of Renaissance man, very well-rounded. Um, he was interested in art, literature. He funded archeological digs. Um, he just was a very well-rounded scholar. Um, he, and during his own undergrad at the University of Pennsylvania, he was a part of a student group um, that worked on the first full complete translation, English translation of the Rosetta Stone, um, which is um, a tablet with Egyptian hieroglyphs. And he illustrated it as well. So that image that you see is his um, artwork, his own original artwork. Um, he also um, was a poet. He wrote poetry. We have some of his poetry in the archives. And for the 25th anniversary of Stevens, um, he wrote um, Paraspera ad Astra, our motto, and dedication in honor of the Stevens family. So Morton and Carnegie were good friends. Carnegie came on as a board trustee member in 1891. And he donated money um, for the Carnegie Laboratory of Engineering Building, which was completed in 1902. And you can, um, there's a funny story between Morton and Carnegie. When um, they had become quite close and they would go out to lunch often. And um, um, Andrew Carnegie and his wife, um, Louisa, were having lunch with Dr. Morton and um, Mrs. Carnegie asked Dr. Morton what books he was currently reading. Um, in response to Dr. Morton's reply, Mr. Carnegie stated, oh, Dr. Morton, I never allow my wife to read any books of that kind. And he, then he continued to say jokingly, remember what St. Paul said, the husband shall be the ruler of the house. 
Um, Dr. Mar Dr. Morton then quickly replied, remember what the poet said, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. Um, Dr. Morton went on to publish a book, um, a pamphlet really, of poetry by that same title, The Hand That Rocks the Cradle Rules the World, and he dedicated it to Mrs. Carnegie. Um, also, when Andrew Carnegie donated money to Stevens for the Carnegie Building, um, he had written a letter to Dr. Morton which stated, it would give me the greatest pleasure to devote 50,000 to the building of the engineering laboratory as you suggest. We owe much to Stevens for many valuable men have come to us from it. So um, quite a compliment. So he's already had such a good experience with Stevens grads that he was happy to donate the money for the building and be a part of Stevens. Um, he donated additional funds to make sure that the building could be completed. Um, and he stayed on as a board of trustee member until he had passed away. Um, the letter that you see to the right is um, a letter that Carnegie wrote to um, Alexander Humphreys, Dr. Humphreys, when he, he he's, um, Morton had passed away in 1902 and Humphreys became the second president of Stevens. And you could see that, he, you know, he, he was very um, sad that he had lost his friend. A lot of people don't know this, but Stevens used to have a high school on campus. Um, it was called the Stevens School. So when Stevens first opened on September 20th, 1871 was the official date. We had 21 students, um, eight faculty members. And as they progressed through the year, they learned that high school students weren't really ready for a mechanical engineering curriculum. Um, they weren't really prepared out of high school. And so Stevens decided to create its own high school, which they did um, starting in 1872. And at first the Stevens School was located in the Edwin A. Stevens Building Hall. Uh, it, was on, it was in the east wing of um, the Edwin A. Stevens Building. And then in 1887, they erected a new building called Recitation Hall. Um, and then the Stevens School um, moved to Recitation Hall starting in 1888. Um, it, would remain there until around 1917. And then Recitation Hall became repurposed on campus and it was used for other departments for other classes until 1955 when um, they vacated Recitation Hall and they um, tore it down soon after that because they made room for the new building that they were building, which, was, which is now Burchard. So there's so many great stories of early alumni that I just wanted to highlight a few. Um, and it also depends on like on what we have documented in the archives. Um, so with the, the case of Edward A. Euling, we actually have an unpublished autobiography of him. So I was able to learn a bit more about him. Um, he graduated 1877. So he entered, he entered Stevens in 1873. Um, he, he has a funny story in his autobiography about how he learned about Stevens. So he started taking the Scientific American magazine um, at home, which in his home was um, a farm in Wisconsin, which is where his family lived. And he saw the advertisement, the very first advertisement of Stevens in the August 1871 scientific american and he was like father this is exactly where i want to go i want to go to this school and he was very sure about it um and then his best friend offered him um a chance to go to venice italy to go to the world's fair that was happening during that summer and so his father said that was the same year he was supposed to enter stevens he, his father told him you can either pick venice or you can pick hoboken and so he picked Hoboken and he went to <laughs> Stevens in 1873. Um, after he graduated in 1877, he actually became um, Robert Thurston 
um, his assistant, Robert Thurston, is the, was the first mechanical engineering professor at Stevens and also um, the first president of ASME, um, which also started at Stevens. So he worked with him and then he actually he, uh, went on to um, creating his own um, company on scientific instruments. And he became well known for the invention of the pig iron casting machine. And he developed the standard pyrometer. He also lived until he was 103 years old. And he says that his secret to long life was to never nag at life. Um, John W. Lee, a lot of you probably know his name um, a little more. So he um, graduated 1880. And when he entered Stevens, that would have been 1876. Um, the US was celebrating their centennial anniversary. 1870s was a very exciting time for engineers um, the, and, and, and innovations in general, inventions. Um, Edison, um, you know, in, um, invented the incandescent light bulb, the phonograph, um, the telephone was invented during this time and Edison helped with the microphone in the telephone. And Lieb was very much influenced by that. In his senior year at Stevens, he visited Edison at his Menlo Park laboratory, and him and his classmates were able to see um, the incandescent electric lighting system that he had invented. But after Lieb graduated from Stevens, he actually already had a job waiting for him in Cleveland, Ohio. And so he went to um, take that job. It was uh, with a company that was working with arc lighting. And, but he wasn't happy there. He felt like he felt like he was missing out, it seemed like. And so when he came back for a holiday break, he decided that he didn't want to go back to Ohio. And so he actually paid a visit to Thomas Edison and asked him for a job. And pretty soon he became the manager of the Pearl Street Station in New York City, which was the very first commercial central power plant in America. And after working there for a year, he um, was chosen by Edison to go to Italy and install the very first central station in that area, which happened to be in Milan, Italy. And he would end up living in Italy for 14 years. Um, and while he was there, he was working on some type of canal construction and he uncovered a lock with that with further research he learned was designed by Leonardo da Vinci. And that kind of spurned his interest of collecting everything that he could find on Leonardo da Vinci, learning about Leonardo da Vinci. And to this, and then the collection that we have in the Samuel C. Williams Library is from John Lieb. It's the John W. Lieb Memorial Collection of Leonardo da Vinci that we've had since 1932. Um, also, when Lieb came back from Italy, he um, became a pretty well-known scholar on Leonardo da Vinci. And in January of 1922, he actually sold out Carnegie Hall, um, conducting a lecture on Leonardo da Vinci, which is pretty impressive. Um, by the time that he passed away in 1929, he, um, was the vice president and director of the New York Edison Company. There's a lot of dreamers um, of the Stevens students and alumni. And I think Igor Benson and James Braxton are really good examples of that. Um, and just to start like a quick quote, um, in 1945, there was a New York Times article that wrote about Stevens, and they said this about Stevens at this time. Stevens Institute has been a pioneer in engineering education. Its repute and the fame of its graduates are known around the world. From Castle Point and Hoboken has come a good proportion of the vision, the knowledge, and the ingenuity that have created the wonders of our mechanical age. Um, Igor Benson graduated in 1940. He was originally from Russia. Um, he immigrated to the U.S. in 1937. Um, he came in via Belgium and he started at Stevens soon after he got to the U.S. Um, Igor Benson is known as the father of the gyrocopter. 
He, um, he formed his own company called Benson Aircraft. And prior to that, he had studied the application of jet propulsion to helicopters at General Electric. It was his dream to bring flight to everyone, not just flight, but personal planes, um, which is what he liked about the gyrocopter. Um, when he did his first public dem demonstration of the gyrocopter um, in 1956, um, he was stated as saying, if you can ride a bicycle, you can fly this machine. Um, his spirit of Kitty Hawk gyrocopter is actually on permanent display at the Smithsonian. Um, the gyrocopter might not have ever really taken off, but I love that he never gave up that dream. Um, James Braxton, Stevens class of 1937, um, very active Stevens student. He was in the Dramatic Society. He wrote for the Stute. He was on the Dean's List. After he left Stevens, he went on to become a professor at Howard University. And he also was a chief engineer for a general contracting firm in Washington, DC. Um, but he then went to Harvard University to get a master's in city planning. And that's really where his career took off. His dream was to um, manufacture and design uh, affordable housing systems in inner cities. And so he moved to Chicago and that's where he spent, he formed his company and um, patent an, um, patent an affordable housing system there. And again, he passed away um, just recently really. So he had reached about, you know, hundred years old as well. Um, and th there's a photo of him. He received an honorary degree in 1987, which is um, where that quote comes from when he was receiving his honorary degree. In case you've never seen a gyrocopter, um, <laughs> there is, um, in the James Wan movie, You Only Live Twice from 1967, there's a great scene with a gyrocopter. Let me see if I can. Also with early faculty, again, there's so many stories we could talk about with early faculty, but I'm just highlighting a few that people might not know as much about. Um, I have to admit, Professor um, Leeds, he was the first chemistry professor at Stevens. And you, you have to love someone that brought his dog Grover to all his um, studio portrait sessions. There's something special about that. <laughs> he was the chemistry professor at Stevens from 1871 up until he passed away in 1902. Um, really well loved by the students. Um, you can always like get a feeling from looking through the early yearbooks of what professors really kind of stood out. They had a section called the faculty limericks and so they would write about the faculty members in those early um, yearbooks. And Charles Frederick Crow is another one. Um, he was professor of languages so again, I, I mentioned earlier that the Dr. Morton created the curriculum and, you know, being a very well-rounded scholar himself, he wanted to make sure that there was um, languages and literature and, you know, basically an early humanities department that was very important to him. Um, and uh, during this time as well, uh, most engineers would learn German and French um, during their undergrad. And so Professor Crow, um, he wrote a series of textbooks about titled How to Think in French, How to Think in Spanish, um, How to Think in German that were pretty successful. Um, he himself knew, I think about seven languages. He was fluent in Portuguese, Italian, English, German, French. Um, I think I'm missing something, but he, um, again, he was really well loved by the students and they had a nickname for him. They called him Pop, P-O-P. They just called him Pop Crow instead of Professor Crow. And he, um, the students were, had a real affection towards him. He was, had a great sense of humor. Um, they looked at, at 
at him as a father figure, really. Um, on a side note, he also um, loved to, um, he was a beekeeper <laughs> and he rode his bike everywhere um, and also lived a very long life. Um, professor of chemistry, Irving Lingmeyer, he really got his start um, in his career at Stevens um, in the early days. He was a professor of chemistry at Stevens in the early 1900s. Uh, he wasn't a professor for that long at Stevens, but he um, definitely made his dent. Um, and he won a Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1932. But I, with doing a little bit more research, I uncovered the fact that he was also the inspiration behind Kurt Vonnegut's fictional character, um, Felix Honecker, in the 1963 publication of The Cat's Cradle, which I thought was a pretty cool pop culture fact that I didn't know about before. So just like any other American university, um, we have our own like student traditions, which involve interclass rush games, um, usually would happen at the beginning of the fall semester and also at the spring semester. Um, so Siemens is no different. We'd have tug of war, cage ball, cane spree, flag rush, and different freshman traditions that were laid out in the freshman handbook. Um, what are these games? Uh, I think people know what tug of war is, but some of the other ones that are no longer, no longer exist are a little bit more confusing. So cage ball was a contest in which each class tried to push past um, or punch a large inflated ball down the field, past the opponent's goalpost without having um, the ball touched the ground. So there is, oh, sorry, a photo right there. And yeah. And um, the cane spree actually started at Princeton University, um, it became popular in the 19th century. And in the, case, in, in the cane spree, one representative from each class would advance to the center of the field where a cane was placed between them. And then at the signal, the two participants would battle for control of the cane. Um, many of these traditions like cane spree and cage ball and flag rush, um, which involved you know, rushing to get, capture the flag basically, um, ended in the 1960s. Um, there's also the cremation of calculus, which was started by Stevens students in 1889. Um, I have a few flyers that were posted around campus. Um, there was a, a proclamation because calculus apparently was the most hated class back then, and they wanted to put it on trial at the end of the spring semester, and make sure that, you know, it got, um, <laughs> got what, what, what it was coming to it, I guess. Um, and usually faculty members would be a part of the trial. They would have um, build their cases, basically. Um, and usually, I mean, calculus always lost. And so they would have, you know, a big party and burn calculus and effigy after the, the trial. And that was popular until the 1960s. Um, there's also freshman initiations. Um, you know, again, they were different each through the years, but usually the first year students were required to wear the dink hat. Um, and there was different like punishments that were written down if you were not wearing, if you were caught on campus not wearing the dink hat. Um, for example, at one point of time, um, if you were if you were caught not wearing your dean hat and you were a first year student, you were required to um, take off your pants and go to the gatehouse and sing the alma mater song in front of everyone. Um, thankfully, those are not, no longer happening, but um, that was probably in existence till I guess the 1960s as well. Um, another from the 1964 freshman handbook, it states, the members of the freshman class are required to wear the class dink and bow tie along with a dark suit with a legible name tag at all times when campus. 
So the origins of Attila, um, Attila really started with the Stute newspaper, which started in 1904. They um, wanted to create a type of mascot, something to build, you know, um, school spirit, basically. And so um, an artist on the Stute by the name of Edwin Waldeck, who's Stephen's class of 1905, um, created the first Roto the Duck. Um, Roto the Duck was um, very much a part of the Stutes in their publications from 1904 till about 1908 when it became a weekly publication. And then Roto kind of drifted away after that. They couldn't maybe keep it up with a weekly publication with all the illustrations. And so Roto actually disappeared for a bit. Um, even though with talking to a lot of alumni, the duck was always present at Stevens, even though it wasn't actually official until 1972. Um, they realized they didn't have an official mascot. And so the students voted on a mascot in 1972, something solicited by the student newspaper. And so in 1972, they voted for Attila the duck. And ever since then, we've had um, Attila as the official mascot. And in the archives, we have some amazing illustrations, early illustrations of Roto the Duck that were created by students, which are really impressive. So football at Stevens. Um, so Al I had to include this um, photo because Alexander Calder is actually in this one. He's the second row uh, fourth from right. Um, and he did play football while he was at Stevens. Um, although to his own admission, he was terrible at it. Um, he was definitely probably much better at lacrosse. Um, but football, we were one of the first universities to have a varsity football team um, in the early days. We actually, our team formed in 1872 and um, we played with all the other Ivy Leagues like Columbia um, and Harvard. Um, of course, Rutgers was our big rival. Um, and just to go back to the duck a little bit, there is, we, we do have, um, you know, testimony from, I think, student newspapers, early students, that there was a duck mascot costume that would um, show up at football matches as well. I don't know what happened to that costume, but there was an early 1900s duck costume at one point. Um, Unfortunately, football was, you know, a bit more dangerous back then. It was still, you know, in the 1870s, it was still fairly new and they were getting, you know, more rules and regulations and more um, protection for the players in terms of helmets and um, things like that. But there was a lot of injuries that happened um, during football and there was a near fatality um, that happened at Stevens. And the president at the time, President Humphreys, Alexander C. Humphreys, decided to ban football. Um, the last season was in 1924. And that was due to the injuries. Here's Alexander C. Humphreys. Um, he was actually known as the czar of Stevens. It was an affectionate term back then. <laughs> Doesn't have the same connotation now. Um, this is him with students behind him. They helped um, create the new athletic field in 1920. Um, another little tidbit about Alexander Humphreys, um, you know, he, he had his own kind of tra tragic um, past in the sense that before he took, um, before he was inaugurated as the president, the second president of Stevens, he had been traveling with his family and they were on the Nile River. And unfortunately, his younger son fell into the Nile River and started to drown. And the older son jumped in after him and he lost both of his sons during this trip, which is such a tragedy. And you can imagine how when students were being injured on football, he wanted none of that. Um, um, Alexander Humphreys was actually born in Scotland he, um, he, he went to Stevens, but he also, he went later in life. Um, he was already a successful businessman. He was superintendent of the Bayonne Gas Company, um, but he didn't have the education. He wanted to go back to school. So he went back to school 
in his 30s when he already had a, a young family at home. Um, Dr. Morton, Morton at the time said that it would take him six years to finish, but he finished in four. Um, and then he became the second president of Stevens and also started the um, business engineering department in 1903. So campus growth um, during Humphrey's time, um, there's a lot of new buildings that were um, erected. The Carnegie was completed um, and the Morton Laboratory building was completed in 1906. Both of those buildings happened to be designed by a Stevens alumnus, William Ackerman from the class of 1891. Um, during this time, Humphreys also purchased the Castle Stevens which he turned into a dormitory for students. Um, and then also, it was also a social center and dining hall. And he really ran a really successful fund fundraising campaign and was able to construct the Walker Gym, which was dedicated in 1916. And moving on to um, the two Davis presidents. Um, so in um, 1928, the third president, Dr. Harvey Davis, um, joined Stevens, and he really transformed Stevens into from a small four-year undergrad college to a larger institution with um, sponsored research and graduate-level programs. And then Jess Davis really kind of uh, moved, took that plan and really even went further with it. So you can see the growth during this time. The first graduate program was in 1930. The first master's degree was awarded in 1931. Um, also, of course, there's the experimental towing tank, which was first opened in 1935, um, and then became even more and more important in, during World War II. And um, the first doctorate degree was awarded in 1955 and all the new buildings on campus that were added during this time period as well are listed there. Um, you have to, um, it's important to know, I think that Jacobus Hall and Palmer Hall were the first buildings on campus that were dedicated residence halls. And so you can imagine there's about 600 students at Stephen at that time. Um, the Castle Stevens, which I forgot to mention, only housed 44 men. So it didn't house a lot of students, even though Alexander Calder lived in the castle when he went to school at Stevens. Um, but if you weren't in a fraternity, you didn't really live on campus, you were a commuter. And most of the students were commuters. And when they um, the polled the students to ask them if they wanted to live on campus during this time period in the 1930s, and it was overwhelmingly about like 80% of the students. And so Jacobus and Palmer Hall in 1937 um, were really the first residence halls. Um, Dr. Davis, Harvey Davis, um, because students were such commuter students, he wanted to make sure that the students had a bonding experience together because um, they would usually just go to class and leave. And so, and also just to gain the hands-on experience as well, which was so necessary um, with an engineering degree back then. So in, between 1930 and 1955, um, Stevens actually ran a summer engineering camp and all students were required to go before their sophomore year. And I think it was a six week camp program. And they, uh, during this time, I, I'm sure that they had fun, but they also, you know, were able to, um, you know, connect and bond. And so we have some great photos of this camp. A lot of you probably, know about the SS Stevens, um, the first floating dormitory. Um, in 1971, Stevens became co-educational. Um, I think they were kind of looking for more dormitory space, probably knowing that it would become co-educational soon. And so they purchased um, the SS Stevens, which previously was the X SS Excorda, um, a luxury liner. And um, between 1968 and 1975, that was a floating dormitory that housed about 150 students. I only learned this recently. I always thought the 
what people refer to as the Ho Chi Minh Trail at Stevens was the wooden stairs that used to be there. <laughs> and I was um, schooled by some very kind alumni that told me that no, it was basically a dirt path right behind the house center that students would um, walk down to get to the SS Stevens. The only photo I've been able to really find on it is in the 1973 link yearbook. And so you can see they actually had some, um, what, they, what they called downhill derbies um, and races down this dirt path, which again was right behind the house center. So if anyone knows of um, any other photos that are out there, I would love to see them. And of course, it was called the Ho Chi Minh Trail because that was during the time of the Vietnam War. Um, 1971, um, we become co-educational. This is a great spread from the Stevens Indicator during that time. Um, because uh, we, um, we don't have as much documentation of the woman at Stevens. So th that's actually how the Voices of Castle Point oral history project started because um, I wanted to document some of the first women um, alumni at Stevens. Um, so it kind of started with that, but now it's branched out to everyone, anyone that's interested. Um, I know, especially during this time when we're all at home, um, it's a good time for reflection. And if like you have any interest in sharing your stories and your memories, so that's part of what makes Stevens history. So um, just reach out to me and let me know. I'd be happy to um, record your memories. We have some great clips on our um, project page. Um, we have faculty members as well. Um, but here's like a little clip of just um, Martha Conley talking about one of the pranks on campus, which I thought was kind of funny. Close to New Jersey. Were there any big pranks that happened on campus while you were there? Oh, yeah. That, can you please talk about that? I can't believe you waited this long to ask me that. I know. Yeah, so of course everybody would paint the horses, you know, genitals and other parts of the horse every year, but um, um, I guess they had a panty raid at one point in time. And then one, when I was a, I guess I was a senior, junior or senior, the women decided they would have a panty raid in the men's dorm. So the freshmen ran to the men's dorm screaming, this is a raid, and started to grab the men's underwear and then put it on the horse. <laughs> Which, I think the men just got a charge right now. I thought it was pretty. We are on social media. Um, the Sam C. Williams Library has a great Instagram account that will update you on all of our remote services and events coming up. And then Stevens Archives has an Instagram account as well. So we kind of like to post little fun tidbits here and there. So please follow us on Instagram. And that is it. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. And again, I'm going to send out a survey at the end of this. So 